Hello. So um, this is Sebastian Kükler, and uh, he will now uh, talk about the new K, uh, K development uh, K desktop environment uh, for dot one. Yeah. Hi. So I'm Sebas, and I'm a KDE hacker. And today I want to tell you a bit about KDE4, where we've been, where we're going. Um, let's start off with where it all started. That was in 2005, in April, there was a meeting in Berlin, and it was called Appeal. And that meant that uh, different, uh, different people, uh, graphics artists, usability people, and uh, software developers, um, came together and they talked about the future of the free desktop. Appeal was the beginning of KDE 4, point, uh, of KDE 4 really. So those people in Berlin, they defined a vision. The new free desktop should be easy to use and beautiful. It should be powerful and above all, it should be free. So how do you accomplish such a project? How do you go from a vision to some tangible software you can actually uh, start to use. First, you need to build foundations for it. So uh, we started, and it cost about two and a half years, a bit more than that, to put the foundations into place to build a new desktop. Those foundations are Qt4 and Oxygen on the graphical side. And um, well, Qt4 was, was pretty new at, at that time, and it meant it is much more modular. That means that you do not have to use uh, use X11 when you want to use Qt. You can uh, use the Qt network classes if you want to write an application. At the same time, all the painting in Qt has been redone. Um, there's now different backends for painting. Uh, for example, you can paint through XRender. You can paint through uh, through OpenGL. It also means that you have anti-aliased graphics everywhere and that you uh, also have ARGB, so uh, translucency, in your graphics everywhere. So some things uh, that involve a window manager that also needs compositing. And it, uh, Qt4 right now also means lots of SVG usage um, technologies uh, such as WebKit. So it's, it's growing and becoming a more and more complete platform while still being modular. So you really only use those part or, or load those parts that you actually use. Two KDE technologies that are really central to this, uh, to this vision of PL has are Phonon and Solid. Phonon and Solid actually have, have a lot in common. They're both built to, to build platform independent libraries. Phonon is a multimedia uh, backend in KDE. It's basically a small, very simple wrapper library around different multimedia systems. So right now, for Phonon, we have backends for GStreamer, for Xine, for DirectShow on Windows, and for, what's it called on Apple? Good. <laughs> Great time, right. So this, those technologies make it, make it possible to easily use hardware and multimedia content in your applications. So this, this chapter of building the foundations was basically found its first um, real milestone in KDE 4.0, which was released this year in January. In KDE 4.0, uh, we said, the libraries are now stable to use. We won't change uh, stuff until uh, KDE 5.0, which means if you write an application now against the KDE 4.0 libraries, you will not have to recompile it until you want to use KDE 5.0. So you, uh, basically everything from this point on is backwards compatible. This is a huge commitment. This means we're very confident of this API and we're very confident that it scales well and, and basically helps us going into the future. You see, uh, KDE 4.0 was also the first release of Plasma, which at that point was not quite so mature. Um, actually, it was the, the least mature part of the whole desktop, and it was also the most visible one. So it's kind of tricky to communicate what this release really means to us when people are, oh, looks like shit. <laughs> also, um, not all applications are ready. Um, when you build the foundations, you need 
to port the applications on top of it as well. So um, one of the big missings in KDE 4.0 was that, uh, that there was no KDE PIM, which means mail client, organizer, address book, all that kind of stuff. So that was not there in KDE 4.0. We had that. And we had this. And now, three weeks ago, we had KDE 4.1. And there were really huge improvements made all over the place. KDE 4.1 means, let me find the right paper. Right. Lots of improvements in Plasma. We've, uh, um, we can now use in Plasma uh, new features in Qt. So we can, Plasma is basically a huge canvas. And now we can embed applications and application widgets in the canvas. That has just been made available in uh, Qt 4.4, which was released in May. So we needed, we needed to, to change a couple of things. Uh, internally on Plasma, and now we um, we can use all the layouting, the widgets, um, uh, style sheet stuff that's actually in Qt 4.4. Really nice, saves us a lot of code. Also, um, fixes all over the place. Of course, um, you know we've we've got um, much more. Many more people saw uh, saw our applications and, and libraries, and I said, okay, uh, this does not work really yet because they're the first user. So uh, we started fixing those things and, and we're much more confident in our libraries right now that, that they're actually not only stable in terms of API, in terms of interfaces, but uh, uh, lots of bugs squashed. We have 19 new applications. That new also means ported from, uh, from earlier KDE versions, which is really a lot. And then we have, um, as I said, new features all over the place. Those new libraries now trickle down into the applications and make it actually very, very easy to, um, for example, embed multimedia content, uh, use um, information directly from the web through uh, WebKit and uh, Qt's network classes. And well, people have been busy bees, basically. And also, uh, we released tech previews for three new platforms. Um, Open Solaris, I saw there here as well. I will try to get a t-shirt uh, later on. Um, but we also released tech previews of uh, <coughs> some applications for macOS and Windows. And this is now solid and phone on with their um, different backends are starting uh, to pay off. Okay. So new platforms, they're right now in tech preview uh, stage. We, uh, we still need to sort out a couple of, uh, of problems such as um, we need a hardware backend for different uh, things on Windows such as Bluetooth, such as power management. And the developer community within KDE who works on Windows is still pretty, pretty small. It's like five people maybe. But they're doing an awesome job. And uh, I think last week, uh, FreeBSD packages for KDE 4.1 became available. And I also heard that uh, more, conservative more conservative distributions such as Slackware are picking up KDE 4.1, and it's really great to hear. Most important for me, though, is, is the growing community. In the last six months, we saw that 166 new people wanted to join KDE development, and awesome. That's 166 people that say, hmm, this is interesting. I, I want to work on this and not, not just a one-time patch. Um, we only give SVN accounts to people that say, I'll be there for, uh, for an extended period of time. So um, who wants to see more black slides with white letters? <laughs> So yeah, um, I prepared a demo. In fact, I prepared a short story in front of a long demo, which you just heard. So, in KDE 4, we introduced a couple of new applications. Oh wait, I want this one. New applications. Um, this is one. This is. Can everybody see this? Yeah. 
Okay, <laughs> this is which wall? Okay, can someone please turn off the light for me? Then I'll just go on until that happens. So, um, our new file manager is Dolphin in KDE 3 and earlier. We used Conqueror for file management and web browsing, and that gave us a um, headache to get right in the user interface. Basically, it, it meant you, sometimes you have buttons with Thanks, Dynamo. He's a KDE hacker. He can <laughs> push buttons. Um, so uh, using a web browser and the file manager in the same applications um, brings lots of funny interesting situations, uh, such as you want to change toolbar buttons depending on in which mode this application is in. And you end up with really huge configuration dialogues and, and need to find the right uh, things in those dialogues. So we wrote an application which is optimized for file management, and we kept Conqueror uh, in place to, to do also both tasks. So right now, we default to Dolphin as file manager, and you can still use Conqueror if you're used to that. Um, Dolphin is, I really like it. I, I use the command line less and less. Now, uh, now we have Dolphin. So basically what you see is we have a sidebar on the left and an information bar on the right and a large pane. Um, of course, you can change how, how you want this uh, to look like. See, it's... Uh, it's really flexible. So the, uh, the places bar on the left actually uh, gives you access to uh, your directories. And it also brought a USB stick. And it will also, uh, also show you removable devices so you, uh, you really have the things you, you will need at your fingertips. And Okay, there we go. So we uh, now get a notification that, uh, that the USB stick has been plugged in, and we also see it over there. So the uh, nice thing about, uh, let's see. This sidebar is not, also, not only uh, available in Dolphin, but we also have it uh, in all our applications. So right now, if I want to uh, save or open something from my USB stick, it's not a big deal. That's a, there's a capacity uh, indicator for that thing. This is new in uh, KDE 4.2. At the same time, uh, if something crashes, this is not KDE 4.1 running. This is a trunk version, which will become KDE 4.2. So we're already well on the way into um, the next release. This is, developers always live in the future. <laughs> Sounds exciting, but it just means that your software is unreliable. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, see, I can very easily interact with uh, with removable media uh, through this sidebar, and it. You see, it also updates. As soon as I put uh, something in one sidebar, this is a model view thing. Uh, all the other um, all the other sidebars change at the same time. So, who in this room uses double click to open files in a file manager? Oh, surprisingly little. How many people saw their mother clicking twice on links in web pages? <laughs> okay. So we thought about that, and, and um, the, basic, the basis is that uh, the interfaces are inconsistent. Opening uh, something in a web page is a very different thing from opening something in a file manager. Now, we don't think it's true. <laughs> we turn it the other way around. Um, so why, why no? or why no single click in file managers? And it's, it's simple because when you try to select something, 
it will not really select it, but you know it opens it. So if you want to uh, select multiple files, you, you keep opening them and, and it's really clunky, or you have to use the keyboard to do that. And what we implemented is, you see in the top left corner of the selection, you see this um, small green cross. And if you click on this cross, it selects. And this way you can also... Yeah, that works also in the detail view. So uh, then you need, you basically have the whole icon as, um, as hit for that, and if you click the file name, it will open it. I think it's not even default. So, but um, we, we can, of course, discuss this later. So this is this is one of the things we uh, we tried to solve in a uh, in a way. And by the way, I don't agree with this that it's not intuitive because it's um, we did a lot of UI cleaning up, and it meant we don't we don't want to remove features. We want a cleaner UI, so we have to um, put features in the right place. And this is just one example of of context sensitive um, information we're we're putting into the interface. Because how do you, it, how do you uh, select the range of files now? Um, we, we didn't change uh, anything with respect to that. Right now I'm clicking Control, so you can do, do this. You can deselect everything, and you can use uh, those buttons additionally. So, so most of the icon is actually still opening it, but you get this, uh, this small indicator that if you click there, then something else will happen, and it's uh, you get direct visual feedback to that. So, I think it's it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Definitely improves my way of working with it. Is it a feature only of uh, Dolphin, or would it also work in Conqueror and okay. other um, Dolphin actually uses uh, uses a component technology that is uh, called KParts, <coughs> and that means that we have this file system view. Not only in Dolphin, but we also use it in, for example, the file open dialogs or in Conqueror. So um, we only do this kind of work once. Uh, yeah, you can do that, but uh, I'm now in single click mode. So if you switch back to double click, then. I don't know. So you mean double clicking on the plus icon? Oh yeah, then you probably open twice. Yeah. But, right. Okay, I was talking about context-sensitive actions, and the same is true for uh, Gwen View, which is the new image viewer. There was also a version <laughs> available in KDE 3. Right now, we have Gwen View as default image viewer in, uh, in KDE 4. So you see, I've, I've got an overview of different images. And here again, you see, when I, when I hover an image, I get a couple of actions directly where the image is. So um, it's not like... I, I'm, I'm busy working on, in the top left corner, and suddenly something over there changes, and I go like, what happened? And of course, it was too fast. So now we have those context-sensitive uh, things. So you can basically read through your images. OK, this needs to be rotated. This needs to be rotated. And you, you just walk through it and, and click on it. And at the same time, it cleans up uh, the user interface, because we do not need those buttons <coughs> in the toolbar as well. We also have the sidebar in Gwen View, which offers a lot more. I'm not sure this is probably not readable, is it? OK, we have um, options like uh, those rotate options in the sidebar. Um, but we can also uh, copy, move, resize images. 
So the image viewer also allows for basic image operations, which are uh, very common. You don't want to start up um, large photo editing applications only you know, to resize the photo for your blog. Can we, um, I'm, I'm afraid we might run out of time this way. Can we um, put questions to the end? And I'll sure. promise I'll leave some time. Sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, so um, context sensitive actions and, and a more dynamic uh, user interface are really important points of, uh, of Gwen View. And got a full screen view. You get a toolbar with that so you can quickly you know, browse through your images. It appears when, when you move the mouse there. So full screen really stays full screen unless you, um, you want to browse images. Or this uh, thumbnail bar is also available in the, uh, in the image view. So what you actually see here is we have a pretty powerful basic uh, image viewing applications with a fairly clean UI. The config configuration dialog is understandable. But you can, you can do a lot uh, with this application. And um, I think Gwenview shows really well what usability can do. Um, usability is often understand as you are removing all the features I want to use. Um, we thought about target groups. We, we said, OK, most of our users are not idiots. That doesn't mean that they do not want to, do, to have easy to use user interfaces. So we, we tried to combine that. And we came up with ways to, to put the features we need into, into, in a smart way into our user interfaces. OK, everybody is talking about integration of the web, integration of online content. and. So that, uh, what we think about is um, web browsers are actually awful interfaces for a lot of applications. You have very complex applications in a website, and then you have back and forward buttons. And what we are trying to do is we integrate content from the web. We do not really integrate web pages, but we, we, make, it, we make it easy for application developers to use online content in their applications. One of those uh, examples, which is also, I'm, I'm always getting beaten up when I do not demo Marble. So um, here you go. Marble is a, uh, is a desktop globe. And this is the first time uh, you see, see it in this presentation. So there will be a second time. So we have a, a globe with this is not, uh, not hyper-accelerated. This works basically um, through optimizing the shit out of the code. And it only took the guy three years. So yeah, this doesn't really look uh, very interesting. What we can do is use different overlays. So here's an, uh, here's an overlay which actually shows the Earth and clouds. In the future, we might be able to, to use real-time information to render the clouds uh, onto the globe. So you can just zoom in and, and uh, see if it's sunny over there or not. Sorry? Already? OK. Danimo just said it's, it's already in there. Um, can check right now. So we have different uh, different overlays of that. Um, the first thing I thought about Marble is, wow, this guy is putting a lot of a lot of work into something that is, in my opinion, really a niche thing. I don't think it is anymore. It's really an amazing application. It can be used in. So here we've uh, we've got uh, a temperature overlay for. Uh, for this application, so it's it's also very um, for for climate uh, researchers, for example. And then my favorite overlay is where is it? 
uh, yeah. So this is um, information from the OpenStreetMap project. Um, OpenStreetMap is basically a large bunch of people all over the world with bicycles and uh, GPS receivers that um, try to map the whole world and make the data freely available. And that fits really nice in how, um, how many people inside KDE think about, um, about data and web, service, web services that not only the sh software should be free, but ideally you should be able to use free data. And um, I think the OpenStreetMap uh, project shows really well what those benefits can be, namely that it makes it really easy to, um, to build new and cool applications based on their data. So large parts of Europe are, uh, um, are mapped already. Um, it's, it's growing all the time. You don't need uh, any upgrades. We get the data directly later, please. We get the data directly from the uh, OpenStreetMap servers. So uh, more people uh, using their bikes and GPS receivers and uh, your uh, card material will improve. So those were three applications. And most of the things that, that you've seen until now are in KDE 4.1. A couple of small things aren't, which I could not really hide until now. Um, I invite everybody to walk by the KDE booth and just have a look at how the desktop behaves and looks like right now. Um, I've, I've brought with me a relatively light machine, an Intel Atom processor with 1.6 gigahertz and one uh, giga, gigabyte of memory. So it, it runs on that machine. It's over there, set up with KDE 4.1. Try it, see if you like it. OK, um, Plasma. I'm, I'm a Plasma hacker. That's why I like to talk about that. So in, in KD 4.0, as I said, Plasma was fairly limited. In KD 4.1, I think we addressed most of the needs of people wanting to use this new desktop shell and a bit more. So we, for example, we built a new panel controller. I've just unlocked the desktop means that I can change uh, all kinds of stuff. I usually keep it locked so I don't, um, I don't end up changing things on my desktop while I uh, just want to do work. So for example, the panel. There's a couple of people around that I do not understand. They put the panel in the middle and then they have huge spaces on both uh, sides and that basically means that you, that you lose a lot of, um, a lot of very um, useful spots on your desktop. So for those people, we built a panel controller that basically works a bit like a word processor. In, in earlier versions of desktops, we, we saw that you get those nice spin boxes and that you can uh, have your desktop at exactly 49% of the width, uh, your panel at exactly 49% per, uh, of the width and pixel precision uh, everywhere. But you're, you, you, you end up reiterating the setup process all the time. So you, you set it up and you apply it and hmm, no, not quite there. And you keep doing that. So we, we tried to shorten this, this setup feedback cycle a lot and uh, came up with a very visual uh, way of setting up the panel. It works a lot like a word processor actually. So um, you can just drag and drop the border of, uh, of the panel controller. You can say, okay, I want it. Um, centered and you start resizing it and then it goes bonkers. So you, um, basically you, uh, you're now able to, to set um, your panel in the size, position, alignment and right. And normally you can also drag and drop it. We're right now doing panel auto hiding and it is already half in there so couple of things might not, uh, might not work at this point. Again, this is the development version. You get this panel controller when you click on uh, the small plasma icon on the left of the panel. It's over here. So as I said, I want it large. 
Okay, yeah. Oh, wait. Align, and then. So yeah, if you want to see uh, if those bugs are also in KD 4.1, walk over to that machine, reproduce it, send us a bug report, and we'll fix it. It's that easy, really. The, the code base is completely new. That means it's, uh, uh, we still know it quite well. It's still fairly clean. So it's also easy to, uh, to find bugs in it, which is also the reason why we dumped uh, uh, Kicker and K-Desktop from KD 3.5. Okay. So um, what is Plasma, really? Plasma is applets and containments. We try to, to boil it down to the very, very simple concepts of having something and having something to put something into. So containers are, for example, uh, the whole desktop as you see it, and the panel is also a container. What you do is you put applets into containers, and the contain containers take care of, of layouting the applets and sizing the applets. You see, if I resize the panel, what the panel actually does is it says, okay, I've got a bit more space, and tells the applets, okay, you can now, um, you can now use this space. And then the applets go like, hmm, cool. I can use this vertical space, so I need this kind of horizontal space, and then everything looks gorgeous or not. So layouting of applets is actually much, much easier if you do it on the desktop, because then uh, you can just put applets wherever you want. A lot of people tend to store files on their desktops. And uh, that didn't work really well in KDE 4.0, because we, we had all kinds of independent small applets representing a file. And we took a look at, at the real workflow involved with that. And it turns out that uh, very often, this, uh, just like people working in their offices, they go somewhere, take a, take a file, put it on their desktop, start working with it, and as soon as they're finished, they're uh, closing everything and putting it back. And then there's a lot of uh, people who use the, uh, the desktop as a space to put files. The, uh, the human brain is actually very, very good at remembering where things were. You won't imagine that when you're looking for your glasses in the morning, but it really is this way. So a lot of people say, okay, I put my, my work files on this part of the desktop, and I put my movies on that part of the desktop. So what you actually do is grouping files. And we found a way to, to make that a bit more visual and to make it harder to clutter up your whole desktop if you, you know, happen to copy uh, 200 files into the same location. That in that case, you would get a scroll bar in the folder view applet. The folder view applet is a view to your file manager, basically. It allows you to, um, to use a part of your desktop in very much the same way as you would use your file manager. So how does this, this workflow of opening uh, a file, putting it on your desk, uh, working, 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 and putting it back uh, work in uh, KDE 4.1? So let's walk over. Um, I put, put my documents on the desktop, say, OK, I want a folder view over here. And then you have your files. You can uh, give it more or less space, depending on, on how you want it. So you can have different, uh, different directories put on your, uh, on your workspace. It makes it, uh, for example, a bit easier to separate different tasks. Very little people um, only work on two or three files. Um, not right now, but uh, we're also working on that. So preview does not work in the, in the folder view currently. But yeah, it's something that annoys me as well. So basically, you can have as many folder views as you want on your desktop. 
And the folder views use KDE's KIO technology, which means that everything is also network transparent. And if I have an internet connection, I can actually Bino is my machine at the office back home. So, so here we can just interact directly over the network with the files on our desktop. What we can also do is only show certain types of files. Like for example, <laughs> hmm. Let's see. So if I only want uh, folders displayed, I can uh, put a filter on this view so you can. Uh, match. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I can have a look at that why uh, the filtering is not quite there yet. Um, so you can say, okay, I want only PDFs from this network uh, path shown on my desktop. For those people using LaTeX, this is probably a godsend. LaTeX uh, has the, the nice tendency uh, to put five temporary files per file you're editing in the same uh, uh, directory. You can filter this out easily. So lots of file interaction with the desktop. Here's a small uh, dictionary. That's pointless. So here we uh, we can use data from uh, from the internet um, and directly embed it into our applications. One of my favorite applets is the Notes applet. And I really use this a lot. Um, I'm working on a document and then uh, someone says blah, blah, blah. And it looks like this. I'm full screen reading um, articles from a couple of years ago. And then I just open the dashboard, which is basically an overview, an overlay of, of the plasma shell on top of everything. And I, I get quick access to, uh, to all the applets and can interact with those. We got uh, lots of applets already. We have a uh, small calculator applet. We have um, a calendar uh, with lots of clocks. <laughs> <laughs> and most importantly, we have Chuck Norris. <laughs> so. Okay, um, apart from what he has to say right now, the interesting thing about the Chuck Norris uh, applet is that it's, it's using um, WebKit. So uh, right now we have a small web browser JavaScript interpreter uh, embedded in the Plasma desktop. And um, this was not a KDE developer who came up with this. Uh, this is actually a macOS des uh, dashboard uh, widgets which uh, we can, can run natively right now in the KDE Plasma shell. Uh, there's also support for Google gadgets uh, coming up. And so, so uh, Plasma allows us to put in different sorts of, uh, of applets into the desktop. Um, so we don't need to write everything ourselves. Speaking of writing everything ourselves, uh, most of the applets right now are writ written in C++. This is a very nice language, but it's also pretty complex and probably overkill for a lot of those small things you want to do on the desktop. Um, we have um, at Academy worked on, Academy is our yearly conference, which was just last week. We've worked on a JavaScript uh, API, so you can, you can use JavaScript to write small um, applets for your desktop. We actually um, have two JavaScript APIs because one is not enough. 
there's a real reason for that. Uh, we have one very limited and simple uh, API that um, is basically totally secure because you cannot uh, get at files, you cannot uh, get at certain operations. We, we have very tight control on what you want to do um, in those applets. And then you, as a uh, JavaScript uh, plasmoid applet developer type of person, decide, I need more power. And you can use a, a full API, which is less secure. You can also use uh, Python, Ruby, uh, I think C Sharp, and interestingly, the Falcon language. So, um, applet development uh, uh, made easy. We, are, we already have uh, a lot of applets, and uh, we are also thinking about the security impl uh, implications of all that. Let me see. Yeah, and again, uh, of course, integration of online uh, content with the Twitter applet. We also have a. Ah, there you go. A nice RSS applet. And um, yeah, that's that's lots of applets and very little screen space. So we've introduced the uh, concept of activities. It's not completely done yet from a uh, from a user interface interface point of view, but. Um, who has heard of the zooming user interface before? The zooming user interface. It's, um, I think it first appeared in a book by one of the uh, first Apple uh, people, um, Jeff Raskin. And he said, well, how about you zoom into certain activities on your desktop? You, you put applications and, uh, and documents together in a certain, certain space. Um, I already said that the, the spatial memory for human beings works really well. So how about I, I have a huge desk and put my work things here and put the books I'm reading over there and uh, have different things over here. So we started implementing that. And again, we get funny layout. So what we can do is we zoom into a certain activity. An activity for me would mean a couple of applets, maybe RSS feeds of uh, who's committing code uh, uh, in the place where I work, um, notes, this kind of stuff, maybe uh, small ov overviews with uh, what email is related to this. And we, uh, um, at five o'clock when we stop working, yeah, right, just change to a different activities where um, our social life is, is displayed, Twitter, RSS, um, uh, contacts I can, uh, uh, I can chat with, that kind of stuff. So, so basically, um, lump applications and applets together into something you do. And then you zoom in and zoom out on, uh, on those activities. So here's a, here's a really basic first uh, implementation of that. And uh, we're looking into combining this with uh, uh, compositing stuff. For example, in, uh, in our window manager, we have the overview of a virtual desktops here. And it, this really fits in nicely with the contact, uh, con <coughs> concept of activities. So we're trying to, to marry those two. This is 4.2, maybe 4.3 material to get it uh, really working nicely. But you can already use it. The shortcuts to switch between those activities work already pretty well. So, um, yeah, and it works really well on desktops already, but, let's see. Okay, we have uh, those devices. This is a uh, Nokia internet tablet, and uh, Nokia was, was friendly enough and donated 150 of those to KDE developers. And it didn't take really long to get um, KDE also running on those internet tablets. Those have, uh, I think, 400 megahertz ARM CPU and 128 megabyte of, um, of physical memory. 
it runs okay. It's it's not yet very fast, but then uh, Trolltech is uh, or the Qt developers are working very very hard on optimizing uh, Qt Graphics View, so we get a really really fast canvas to um, to put plasma on top of this. The funny thing is that the uh, Enlightenment Foundation libraries, you know, one of the other uh, desktops, have been ported to use Qt. And um, it has just been committed yesterday, the first Plasma applets that are using the Enlightenment Foundation libraries and with it, uh, lots of cool uh, animations, tricks, and uh, graphics effects we can now start to use in Plasma. So it's very exciting to, to work on Plasma right now. This is one of the mobile devices uh, we uh, started working with. And the OpenMoco uh, phone is another one. Um, again, it's not really fast yet, but it shows that platform independence is not just lip service. So I promised um, that we would have some time uh, left for questions, so we can start now with that. Um, understood, agree, uh, working on that. That's a short version. Um, you're right that applets are basically some kind of windows. And why do you have a window manager? Why do you have applets? Uh, what's the difference between those? Um, well, that's a technical difference, of course. So we're putting work into, um, into blurring the lines between what's an applet, what's a window. That's, uh, on the one hand, um, a step that we are able to integrate um, widgets into the plasma surface. On the other hand, that we need to make those things behave just as, as Windows uh, do. Um, we're not there yet. It's, it's a bunch of integration work. It's lots of small solutions to, uh, to this one big problem. But it's definitely on the radar to get this uh, sorted and more clear. <coughs> The short answer is I don't know. Um, <laughs> the promising uh, one is uh, somebody is working on a, a different implementation of the thumbnail viewer, which extracts the thumbnails from uh, from the images metadata. Uh, how this is uh, solved technically exactly, I'm not sure. We we do uh, rely a lot on uh, on Qt there. I'm sure as soon as uh, there's more than one person who wants to implement uh, thumbnail viewer or uh, support for different image types, someone will come up with a um, uh, with a small interface to make that really easy. This is, yeah. More questions? The alternative would be uh, I've got a couple of um, unstable applications I could show. <laughs> Just a short question. Is there uh, support for XSLC in Conqueror by now? Um, I don't know. It might. Uh, sorry. As far as I know, not in case you know, but in WebKit. Yeah, it might, might be in WebKit. So. Oh, sorry. One, two, three. Okay. Is it possible to sort the icons in the panel? Yeah. Uh, 
you open the panel controller and start dragging things around. Oh, in the uh, in the taskbar itself, uh, not yet implemented. Okay. But taskbar grouping uh, is one thing that is right now being worked on. Uh, how much is the uh, Sorry. How much is oh, um, I, I would say it, it will. Um, oh, yeah, two things. It runs uh, acceptable on. Uh, 265 megahertz and 900 to it, it runs fine on an EPC. It runs quite okay on uh, on a Memo device. So, uh, oh yeah, the, the most important thing it, it degrades nicely. So if I got a huge machine which uh, uh, with a nice graphics card, then uh, you will get all the bling. If I got a, um, a Leica machine, it uh, you can just switch off. Uh, a couple of things and it will still work nicely. Cool. Nice question. Thank you. Yeah. I've actually been uh, mentoring a summer of code project which does exact, exactly that. This is a screensaver. And um, I have a plasma applet on this where I can, for example, I'm stealing your lap, lap dot. Can that work with uh, yeah, basically this is just a plasma uh, on a screensaver. Uh, we're also working on auditing uh, the applets, uh, saying, okay, this applet is allowed to run on a screensaver. Um, but basically, you cannot change it right now. You can only uh, you know, use the applets. Um, this way you could, for example, also put an, a controller for your media player, uh, say Amarok, on the screensaver and not have uh, people, you know, look, look into your emails while you want them to just turn down the volume. Well, yeah, um, basically key, key uh, input is blocked by the screen server, of course. And um, I was able to type, so I guess it works. So widgets on the screen server is, uh, uh, is also something which was fairly easy to do with uh, Plasma. And uh, yesterday, I had a look at the um, state of a uh, couple of applications which um, I'd love to use in a KD4 version. Uh, this is K3B, so basic porting uh, has already been done. Someone told me it would crash when you start to burn a CD, so it's uh, still work in, pro uh, in progress. And right. This takes a while to start up. I've got this new five, uh, uh, 12 megapixel Digicam. So, um, We have, uh, I'll show you uh, KRunner in the meantime. It's a uh, small uh, command line uh, interface we can use to start applications, as you saw. And we can also use it to um, run through your bookmarks. Um, I've just uh, uh, written a small plugin for KRunner that uh, uh, searches your web browser's history, that uh, can start sessions uh, for your document editor, um, and another one which, uh, another one which searches uh, recent files and the K runner is plugin based we have lots of uh, lots of cool things that you can do with this uh, small command line interface such as calculate so basically teach the computer on how to understand you uh, one of those plugins is maybe 40 to 50 lines of code Tell him, okay, uh, match this and do that if, if it matches. And everything is uh, threaded and animated nicely. Uh, I see that you have done a lot of work on your desktop. Um, but one thing that surprised me a little bit when I started on the day before I was that um, the thing inside of the window is much vertical, like it looks to be basically three times larger than the front end. And that is an aspect that I've never liked about the game. Windows work and how controls are mm. working. Is there, and, and 
Yeah. Um, actually, we're uh, we're working on human interface guidelines, and uh, as those human inter uh, interface guidelines become more complete, more mature, more well known to the developers, you know, this this uh, uh, takes some time to to trickle uh, into the developers. Uh, the really important thing about that is uh, that with KDE four, we've really integrated uh, usability and artwork. Um, <coughs> into the whole development process. So it's not only hackers, but it's, it's basically all kinds of people who are interested in creating uh, a really cool desktop. So it's, it's getting better. Just uh, in the last week, we have, um, I think, fixed all label alignments in, uh, in KDE base. So huge thing. Can you find a bug report? Thank you. Um, Just we get a new. So I've I've got two minutes left, and I really needed to show the um, two really cool things in Digicam. Um, this is a search based on uh, on a small sketch. So uh, so you can have your index. Uh, you can just re wait. So you paint something, and then it finds uh, images corresponding uh, to what you've been painting. <laughs> so yeah, I tried a uh, sunflower green. This actually works really fast, because it, it indexes your images once. It took 20 minutes on, uh, on a folder with a couple of hundred images. And then it, it basically finds images within one or two seconds. And it's really fun to use. And also, marble, close. Uh, Geotagging uh, in photos is, uh, is coming up as well. So ideally, you, uh, you take your, your internet tablet, plug in your camera, uh, everything gets, uh, gets tagged with uh, your current GPS information, and you just sync it to your desktop computer when you're at home. Yes, yes. So everything is global. Uh, it's not um, local to one application. You can uh, come over there and we'll answer any questions. Thank you very much for your interest. I hope you enjoyed the talk.